Folks could please take their seats and quiet. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, Mike Bond, I'm the chair. I'm joined by Nuri Martinez of the 6th District, my colleague. I believe Mr. Koretz will be joining us. Uh, I am going to start with general public comment. Is there any general public comment, Mr. Clerk? No, sir. Multiple items. Okay. Seeing none, um, general public comment is closed. Multiple item. I close that too. Uh, are there any multiple item? No, sir. Okay. So having... Uh, seeing none of that, uh, there will be none of that. So uh, we will get on to business. Um, I was going to recommend for uh, consent uh, items 2 through 13. Any objection? No. Okay, items 2 through 13 are approved. Um, so uh, let me um, go to uh, item number one, the general manager's report. Thanks, council member. Um, today we are going to acknowledge, as we usually do, um, some exceptional LEDOT employees. Um, so first, uh, if you'll just stand when I say your name, Traffic Officer Janice Norwood Waller. <laughs> Traffic Officer Norwood Waller began her career with the City of LA in March of 2000. Her past assignments include the Central and Southern Parking Enforcement Office in the beat redesign and benchmarking detail, where officers conduct a survey of the area streets and posted regulations to determine appropriate staffing levels and boundaries beats for enforcement. Officer Norwood Waller is currently working with our high priority scofflaw team. This assignment can be very challenging, requiring officers to locate and immobilize vehicles that have five or more delinquent citations. As a member of this team, Officer Norwood Waller has consistently demonstrated professional conduct in her interaction with the public and her peers. She possesses boundless energy and takes great pride in her work. At LEDOT, there's a focus on creating an environment that is a rewarding place to work. Officer Norwood Waller embodies this spirit by helping manage the Area Office Social Club. And the Social Club, if y'all don't know, does not play around. <laughs> the Social Club is serious. Uh, serving as a member of the Process Action Team and always volunteering for the Office Toy Drive for distribution to kids who are less fortunate. Her consistent positive attitude makes her a pleasure to work with and a favorite among everyone. We're very fortunate Traffic Officer Janice Norwood Waller chose a career with us at LADOT. We commend her spirit and commitment to serving the needs of the city of LA. Thank you for your many years of dedicated service. <laughs> Next up, Officer Jose Castillo. Officer Castillo began his career with the City of LA as a part-time traffic officer in April of 2014 and promoted to a full-time position in January 2016. He's currently assigned to the Southern Area Enforcement Office and works the evening shift, 3.30 to midnight. Throughout his career, Officer Castillo has just dem demonstrated an outstanding work, work ethic and dedication. A recent review of work performance indicators revealed that Officer Castillo is among the top performers for all traffic officers across the city in major duty categories. He consistently leads his peers in handling radio calls for service, impounding vehicles that create safety issues, and in addition, he leads his peers in hours spent responding to traffic emergencies and providing traffic control directions to help ensure public safety. Traffic Officer Castillo is consistently professional in his dealings with the public and works well with his supervisors and peers. His dedication to the city of LA and the community in which he serves has not gone unnoticed. He's an outstanding example to his employees and a valuable member of LA DOT. Please join me in congratulating them for their outstanding performance and their commitment to LA DOT's vision and mission. And that concludes the, the uh, report for this month. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions? No, I don't. All right. Thank you very much. Congratulations to you both. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Okay. Uh, at this time, I will recess the regular meeting and uh, open the special. We can't go into the special until 150. You know how much I hate attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to keep you out of a deposition. <sighs> All right, then. Uh, the clock is wrong, by the way. Isn't there an item 14? Uh, yeah.
uh, I, but there's a large crowd of people here for another item, so I was going to try to help them out. So I was trying to be helpful to the audience here, but blame Mr. City Attorney. Uh, yep, yes we do. Uh, thank you for keeping me out of jail or whatever. Uh, so we will then go to item number 14. Mr. Chairman, item number 14, LA DOT reports relative to a proposed pilot program that we return a portion of the local meter revenue to the locations where it was generated for transportation, transportation improvements and repeating the special parking revenue fund and replacing it with a parking enterprise fund pursuant to the motion of Mr. Bonner and Mr. Rue. Good afternoon. Ken Husting, joined by Josie Valdez from LADOT, Bureau of Parking Management. And we're pleased to be here to report back on a proposed special parking revenue local return fund, uh, program, whereas we returned a portion of the local revenue back into the community where it was generated uh, to improve the quality of life. So last time that I was here, we proposed, uh, we had a draft set of rules, and we're talking about the program, but there were four areas that were not resolved at the time. One was the recipient organization. Another one was the pilot locations. Uh, third one was the revenue sharing percentage. And the last one was the distribution. So based on the guidance that we received from Transportation Committee last time and also doing further research and looking at the data, uh, we do have recommendations for each of those. So with the recipient organizations, we believe that the business improvement districts would be a uh, financially responsible organization that could be able to handle the money that's given to them for the use of improving the quality of life. And also the business improvement districts are currently monitored by the city clerk. As far as the pilot locations, we evaluated nearly two dozen locations across the city uh, that met the 150, minimum, uh, 150 meter minimum criteria. And so what we're looking for was areas that have diverse income levels. And we believe we found three of them that have um, diverse from bringing in a large amount of money to those that are bringing in a more modest amount and in between. And those areas are Lincoln Heights, Westwood Village, and Pacific Palisades. Now, we also looked at the revenue sharing. This one was a little bit more complicated, looking at the different percentages, seeing whether it was appropriate to pick a flat rate or pick a minimum high, a minimum um, guaranteed or a maximum. And so what we did is looking at the revenue, we settled on 15% with a minimum guarantee for any qualifying bid to receive a minimum of $50,000. And the reasoning behind that was to make sure that the qualified bid would have enough money to actually make a difference, whether it's a service or project in that particular area. And finally, the distribution method, what we're looking to do is keep the money within the city where it could be used towards either city services or projects or it could be used on a reimbursement basis. So say, for instance, there's something that the city cannot perform, the Business Improvement District would be able to hire their contractor and the city would reimburse, assuming it's eligible expense. And also attached to the rule, or attached to the report are rules and procedures, which highlight the application process, talk about eligibility requirements, and also the administrative oversight. And so with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I only have one question. What are we doing to provide alternatives for the neighborhoods who don't have an active bid? So what we're looking to do is right now for the sake of the pilot program, because we want to have somebody that can actually sustain an audit, and there's just so many unknowns, and this is going to be our opportunity to find out how what works. If the program is successful, we're looking at beyond the pilot to opening it up to other nonprofit organizations, whether it's a neighborhood council. And how long is the pilot for? The pilot we're proposing would be a year. Okay. And then after you come back and try to deal with... Yeah, so depending on what we learn from that, we could either open it up to other bids or other organizations, but really we, we don't have a good sense right now just how much work it will be. Okay. That's what I have. Okay. Uh, I've got... Uh, oh, there is a public comment card. Thank you. Um, I'm still adjusting to this thing. Uh, we have one public comment card, uh, Andrew Thomas. Hi, good afternoon, council members, staff. My name is Andrew Thomas. I'm the executive director of the Westwood Business Improvement District. We would be one of the recipients of funding for the local return program. Uh, we're very excited about the program. We're thrilled to be uh, uh, included in the pilot. Uh, we have no shortage of projects ready to go that we know would make a uh, impact in our, our district. So I want to thank LADOT for bringing this program forward and uh, I strongly encourage you to support it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
so without objection, that item is approved. Uh, and thank you. <laughs> Ms. Reynolds, is there anybody else you'd like to acknowledge? <laughs> Okay, well, uh, we will adjourn uh, this meeting, and uh, the special meeting will convene in 90 seconds. <laughs> so much for efficiency. <laughs> We go by Cupertino time. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the special meeting of the Transportation Committee of Wednesday, May 23rd, 2018. Uh, I'm Councilman Mike Bond on the chair, joined by my colleagues Nuri Martinez uh, from the 6th District and Mr. Paul Caretz of the 5th District. Uh, we will, uh, it's a special meeting, so there is no general public comment for a special meeting, is that correct? That's correct, sir. Okay, uh, so uh, we will go to uh, item number one. Uh, Mr. Chairman, item number one, it's a report from the Department, Transportation Department relative to the dockless bike scooter share pilot program. This is matter that's also been referred to Public Works Committee. Okay, um, before you come up, Marcel, uh, I'm going to... I'm gonna, that makes it easier to do what I want to do. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to take the uh, public comment first. Is that okay? Um, I think most of the public commenters have read the DOT recommendations. So um, we'll start with uh, Nick Grief and Nathan Holmes and Eric Moody representing um, various council offices. Nick, is it Grief or Grief? Uh, Grief. Grief, sorry about that. No worries. He can uh, rhymes with life if that helps. I used to say rhymes with strife, but then I realized I was kind of antagonistic, so I moved off that. Anyway, thank you, uh, council members and Councilmember Bonnet in particular, uh, for having me here today and scheduling this report back to Councilmember Rue's motion to uh, create a pilot and rules and regulations for the dockless industry. Uh, as noted, my name is Nick Grive, Policy Director for Councilmember Rue, and I speak on behalf of him today in support uh, of these rules and regulations moving forward so we can begin a pilot and determine uh, how to potentially move past that pilot in future to bring this to the rest of the city. Uh, as we know, our residents are clamoring for more transportation options. They want multiple easy-to-use modes of transit to choose from if they don't want to drive and are interested uh, in either losing the sick and family vehicle or potentially going completely carless. Uh, at this point, for many of the people in the 4th Council District, which my boss represents in particular, this is not generally a practical reality. Um, we'd like to make it practical, and we think these rules and regulations today uh, move us forward in that direction. Uh, the boons for 
dockless vehicles are, uh, we think, fairly obvious. In particular, uh, bike share or dockless vehicle share access for all of LA residents, natural solutions to the first last mile problem that we've seen that people actually would like to use and are uh, quick uh, adopters of. Lower emissions, new road users incentivized to advocate for safer streets, uh, as we're already seeing in Santa Monica where people are becoming in more uh, collision contact sometimes with vehicles and uh, this creates more users who want to advocate for safe street improvements. And then, of course, competition for customers that will improve price and services for our residents. We, of course, also want to be uh, very careful to craft policies that avoid issues that some cities have faced after haphazardly embracing dockless vehicles. Uh, we think the DOT recommendations today do a really good job of uh, coming together with a lot of strong protections for the city and in particular uh, putting together the data reporting requirements that can be updated on a continual basis, which we think is an exciting new model. Um, I'm sure you've seen the GitHub that they've put together, but being able to constantly update the data that we get uh, for the city. few specific comments on the regulations that we think might uh, merit some additional review. Um, the $50 per bike in particular for the additional $2,500 recommended for the Cal Enviro screen areas um, we think might prove as a disincentive uh, to increasing bike share access or dockless vehicle access in some of the uh, lower income areas that we want to make sure that this uh, equitably reaches. So we think that's something to potentially look at. And the three mile exclusion zone uh, for Metro bike share might be a little larger than maybe necessary to protect that investment from the city. Uh, in closing, our city is by and large a city of sprawl, and just like a sprawling city is best served by an efficient network of buses that can take advantage of the city's design, dockless uh, vehicles provide an opportunity to serve all corners of our city, regardless of density, and we're excited to see this technology move forward, and we appreciate your review today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moody. Sir, uh, Eric Moody, Transportation Deputy and Innovate 1E Director for Councilman Mitchell Englander. Uh, Council Member Bonin and members, uh, thank you for the opportunity today and thank you to DOT and specifically Marcel Porth uh, for all the hard work that has gone into this report. It's, it's obvious that they've done a lot of research and effort has gone into this. Um, as proposed, it's clear that DOT has thoroughly researched dockless bike share programs and has attempted to provide controls that both encourage this transit solution but also limit operations in an effort to mitigate negative impacts to our communities. Our communities often bear the brunt of the problems associated with these programs. As a result, it's important to allow the community and their elected representative to be part of the process. Council office and community engagement is critical for transportation modes operating in our public right of way. Councilman Englander strongly urges the committee to add a council office letter of acknowledgement where a council office must acknowledge their position on each program application as a condition to granting permits for dockless bike share operation. While the proposed dockless bike program framework includes standard requirements, council offices need the ability to impose more community specific operating requirements as conditions necessitate. Who better understands their communities than the council district and the elected representative who can help focus these projects to communities in their districts that can better utilize them. The city is ultimately held responsible for poor management or lack of follow through on the part of the operators. Therefore, it is imperative that the operator work closely with the councilman or council member uh, early on to understand any community concerns and to address issues as they may arise during development. So thank you for this opportunity today. Ms. Holmes. All right. Good afternoon, committee members. Um, my name is Nathan Holmes and I'm representing Councilman Joe Buscaino today. As mentioned in previous testimony before this committee, uh, we in CD15 are very pleased with the dockless pilot and the manner in which it has enhanced mobility options for people in our district. And uh, I'd like to echo my colleagues here that uh, there's a lot in this LADOT report to commend and it clearly shows a lot of hard work being done. At this time, we would like to focus on one area of concern and that is the geofence requirement that would prevent this dockless, um, excuse me, dockless systems from operating within a three mile uh, radius of a metro station in the harbor area of CD15. Uh, as the map that is included in the report shows, this would remove dockless bikes from a lot of the harbor area. And since metro bikes are only limited to stations on the port area at this time, we would effectively be, effectively be losing bike share in a significant part of our district. And whether you look at this from a strict mobility perspective or from a larger equity lens, this is very concerning. Um, dockless bikes are currently serving as a promising low-cost travel option, and they serve several low-income communities. 
And so we would thus request that the proposed regulations be amended to remove the geofence in the harbor area of CD15. And I'd just like to note that um, uh, you should have received an email from the LA County Bike Coalition that expresses some of these similar equity issues uh, in the last uh, 15 minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, uh, I am now going to call up uh, Mehmet Berker, Joanne uh, Danganen, and John Holland. Uh, and Carl Hansen can come up too, we have four chairs. Uh, one. Okay. Um, uh, uh, before you start, uh, I read uh, 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 your letter. Uh, it was uh, very thoughtful and comprehensive, I appreciate that. Okay, great. If, if you have copies, Number. you might want to share with the full board. I think I have, I think I have one um, that I was using to help myself today. Okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Mehmet Barakir. Um Two things about me that are pretty germane is I don't have a car and I'm a GIS analyst and cartographer by trade. Um, I just wanted to echo what Mr. Holmes said about the three mile buffer. First of all, it's arbitrary. Um, I can't see why three miles was chosen other than it is kind of given as the rough distance that a 30 mile uh, bike share trip can take. But if it is put into effect, it would essentially preclude 20 square miles and 300,000 people living in disadvantaged communities around the downtown area itself from being a participant in any bike share program because they wouldn't be slated for the phase three expansion and they wouldn't be able to get any dockless service to come to them because they'd be within that buffer. And that's just around downtown. Uh, Westchester, West LA, and as Mr. Holmes alluded to, Harbor City and other parts uh, north of Wilmington would also be affected. Um, so yeah, I would just say keep it to the service area if you're going to do anything. So, Thank thanks. you. Please go ahead, Joanne. Hi there, I'm Joanne Dungannon here representing Central City Association. Uh, we represent over 400 organizations here in the city and we're strong advocates for mobility and sustainability. Um, we support efforts to make first and last mile travel easy and accessible throughout the city, but we have a few concerns about LADOT's proposed guidelines. Um, we have submitted a detailed letter with these concerns. The proposed three mile buffer around the downtown LA Metro bike share service area would not unnecessarily bar as many as 860,000 people from using dockless services altogether. We see dockless services as, as complementary to the Metro Bike Share. They can serve areas in and outside downtown that are currently being unserved by a bike or scooter share program. Next, the initial cap of 500 vehicles per operator is too few. High coverage and high concentration are essential in attracting a critical mass of users, and the proposed caps will make it hard to achieve this. We ask that you continue this item for two weeks so we can work with LADOT to enhance these proposed rules and guidelines. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mr. Howland. Good morning, or good afternoon, committee members. John Howland. I'm here this afternoon to speak on behalf of Skip Transport Incorporated about the electric scooter portion of this. With the late scheduling, Skip's representatives were not able to make this meeting. Uh, I want to thank DOT for their report, and we look forward to working with them to help craft these to even more benefit riders, operators in the city. We have submitted a letter to uh, the committee and uh, the city, but we'd like to highlight a few points. We're very concerned about the reports and the rules' lack of details about exclusivity. Specifically, we're concerned about the absence of any information about the number of permit operators that will be granted and about how the process will be undertaken to determine who gets a permit to operate a dockless scooter system in the city. We oppose a first-come, first-served permit system that allows operators to cherry-pick certain locations to operate a virtual or real monopoly. This disadvantages competition and also certain sectors of the city. We also oppose the downtown uh, monopoly, and we believe that LADOT must make clear that 500 scooter limit is a hard cap, meaning that the regulations do not allow uh, people to dump extra in there in order to get free advertising and other ways of hitting that 500 operable limit. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hansen. Yeah, good afternoon, Chair Bonin and Council Members. I'm Carl Hansen uh, with Bird Scooters, uh, Government Affairs Director. Uh, first, let me say we're, we're thrilled to be operating in Los Angeles, bringing uh, sustainable and uh, affordable uh, last mile transit. Um, we uh, look forward to, to working with the city on the permit process, but obviously have some uh, concerns with the, the proposed language and submitted a letter to you uh, yesterday outlining um, our concerns there, I wanted to touch on some of those. Uh, first, the uh, arbitrary fleet size caps, the, the 2,500 total limit, uh, we think would really restrict our ability to service the community. We, we, we already provide uh, more scooters than that. 
uh, in the two districts where we operate. Um, if we were to expand our services beyond into other districts, which we would love to, uh, we would have to reduce our level of service in the in Council Member Bonin's office or Council Member Koretz's uh, district, rather. Um, and uh, the, the, the best way to handle the, the size of fleets, we believe, is through dynamic caps based on utilization. So, so rather than pick an arbitrary number, you want vehicles to be used and not have abandoned vehicles. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speakers are Phil Recht, Tim Elborg, Thomas Lord, Justin Wiley. Mr. Recht of the 11th District. <laughs> I see you. Good afternoon. Uh, Phil Recht representing OFO Bikes. I will submit written comments by close of business today. We have five comments on the rules. I'm just going to itemize them real quickly. Uh, one, the locking mechanism requirement to us is, is a rigid equipment acquire, requirement. Better to have a performance requirement that allows for innovative technological and behavioral solutions to, the, to, to what that's meant to accomplish. Uh, we have the same concern about the fleet size caps. They're unclear, but we think they should be larger and certainly allow each company to have at least a minimum of a handful of pilots in the city. Otherwise, uh, each district won't be able to have any. We agree with the comments on the buffer zone that have already been made and the fees. Lastly, the fleet mix requiring 50% of the fleet to be e-assist or electric. Uh, we understand where that's going directionally. That's really where the market is going, but we think that should also be dictated by uh, utilization like if you require electric in areas that don't really need it, it will drive up costs and be unfair to the citizens in those areas. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Alborg. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Government Relations for Zagster. Uh, Zagster is a U.S. company with over 10 years of experience in bike sharing. Last year we launched our dockless brand Pace. Um, and you know, really today I wanted to say LA doesn't need to become another Dallas. We believe that bikes should lock to things, including bike racks, to help reduce urban blight. Um, and very quickly on the proposed guidelines, we request that LADOT refrain from a, uh, or remain firm on its commitment to locking mechanisms on dockless vehicles to prevent them from blocking sidewalks uh, by removing the last sentence from parking rule B in the document before you today. Um, also, we ask that LADOT revise the fleet size requirements to ensure that dockless companies such as ours with adaptive bikes for people in the disability community but uh, who don't have e-bikes um, to make sure they're able to provide adaptive bikes as part of their fleet. And the final thing I uh, wanted to suggest is that LADOT consider a regular time interval to evaluate and approve increases in fleet size by dockless companies. So quarterly revisions make sense to us, and uh, we have some language we can submit to you on that. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Justin Wiley. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Jump Bikes. Uh, for 10 years, Jump has operated and supplied equipment for bike share systems across the U.S. and Europe, including a regional system next door in Santa Monica, uh, West Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and UCLA. And in, in that time, we've learned a lot about how bike shares work best for communities. Riders need access to bikes no matter where they live or work. Uh, Non-riders need to be assured that the bikes will be deployed in a controlled manner that does not block, block the public right of way. And cities need clear and transparent data to support planning. Uh, on behalf of JUMP, I would like to applaud LADOT. This permit process was clearly very well researched. There's two points I would like to make. Uh, we're glad to see that LADOT required a lock to feature in the permit. For nearly six years, JUMP integrated a locking mechanism our, onto our bikes, which ensures that bikes are uh, correctly uh, parked. And second, we'd like to, uh, LADOT to reconsider the expansion of the service area uh, to allow Los Angeles uh, sorry, le uh, limiting operations uh, to select neighborhoods for a few reasons. The goal is to create a reliable service area throughout the city. Asking riders to track which neighborhoods jump, half, uh, jump bikes are is uh, going to create unnecessary friction in the system. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Thomas Lord. I'm a general manager for Lime. Um, we've submitted uh, a pretty comprehensive review of our comments onto the Git, and we'd like to thank the LADOT for the obvious work that was put into this um, proposal. Um, we have a couple concerns that I'd like to highlight here. Um, again, the fleet size. We don't think we should um, cap the fleet size. Um, parking, we would propose that there's no lock two parking um, in the city. Um, also would echo the geofences. We think they're too big and cut out too much of the market um, for uh, dockless. Um, and that's, that's about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We have one more public comment. Uh, Peter Hoban. Good afternoon and thank you. My name is Peter Hoban. I'm from uh, Bicycle Transit Systems. 
Um, I just wanted to talk quickly about some findings from Portland, uh, Department of Transportation, who recently studied the Dockless system in Seattle. Um, and these, I think, support some of the findings of DOT. In Seattle, they found that 10% of the bicycles were blocking public right-of-way, extrapolated to the fleet size in Seattle, which is about 10,000. That's 1,000 bicycles blocking public access. So I think the lock to mechanism is a must in this um, uh, program. Secondly, when it regards to maintenance, 17% uh, of bicycles were found to be unrideable. 13% uh, had multiple maintenance issues. And 26% had one ma maintenance issue. That's 56% of bicycles with maintenance issues. Extrapolated in Seattle is over 5,000 bikes with maintenance issues. So therefore, I think that a fleet cap is really, really required here until these companies can perform and provide a safe transportation option. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, where is Marcel? Oh, there you are, right in the front row. Good afternoon, council members. Salida Reynolds, general manager, LADOT. So I just want to give an overall framing of sort of our approach and thinking around these regulations and express that from LADOT's perspective, we are keenly interested in welcoming dockless bike share and e-scooters into the city of LA. We feel as though what we do here is foundational, not just for these private companies, but for many others that are going to come after them that we can't even anticipate today. The way that we hold the bar high on data standards and getting information and also taking an iterative approach so that we crawl before we walk and we walk before we run is really important. We have tried to set up these regulations so that we come back on a regular basis every three months and that's our commitment to share how these companies are performing to revisit the things that they are articulating to you that they care most about including the the overall size of the fleet um, and where they are and are not allowed to operate the lessons learned from other cities are that most of these companies are not price sensitive. So while punitive approaches to fining or imposing fees should be part of the picture, we think that a better approach is incentivizing good behavior but and rewarding it with the things that we know these companies care most about, which is the size of their fleet um, and their ability to operate freely throughout the city. So that was really the, the things that we care most about um, is number one, making sure we have have that clear line of data that comes to the city on an ongoing basis. We're the first city in the country to publish our mobility data specifications on GitHub. We have tried to be very responsive um, and smart about the way that we are asking for things and being very clear about what we are asking for. Um, and then um, keeping the things that we think are important as leverage to incentivize really good behavior. So we know that this is a brave new world. Um, we want to get uh, these operators operating in the city as quickly as possible. I would also just underline one thing about um, the regulations. The trip cap is there, but if these operators are willing to deploy in neighborhoods that are might not be their neighborhoods of first choice, they can deploy up to twice as many right from the beginning. So the trip cap exists, yes, for the neighborhoods that they are interested in cherry picking. But for neighborhoods where they might not go at, at first, we've offered an incentive where they can radically increase their trip cap right from the beginning. So I'm going to turn it over to Marcel Porras to, to go over some, some of the details. <laughs> Uh, Marcel Porras, Chief Sustainability Officer. Um, I think one of the best ways to start is by just saying that we are committed to continuously getting feedback from the industry, um, as well as working with our partner cities across the country um, to in, in this new world. Because again, um, what's going to be strong are, are, are regulations that can be adopted nationally. Um, the anecdote I use is that we know what to do at a red light here in Los Angeles, and, and so, the, so do they know in Memphis and in Barcelona. And so it's really important for us to create a framework that allows for regional management of new mobility services we expand. Um, so um, last, last Tuesday, as part of this work, we published um, and shared with the industry our draft rules and regulations, as well as... Um, as the mobility data specification. Um, following that, we, we held one-on-one -on -one conversations with eight of the eight specific companies. Um, 
and encourage them to provide feedback, which they did in written form um, via email, but then also specifically um, onto the GitHub, which is a, I'll let someone else explain that, <laughs> um, which is um, a collaborative um, um, environment for code. And so um, since then, we've received 32 comments. Um, 23 of those comments were, um, from, were specific to the rules and guidelines. Nine of those comments were specifically to the mobility data specifications. Um, and exciting to that is we've also started to receive comments from other cities. And so the city of Santa Monica, um, the city of Austin, and so we're, we're now engaging in a conversation with our partner cities across the country um, so that we can create a mutual standard that is beneficial to cities. Um, the, to summarize the comments, I think they fall into four, four specific bu buckets. Um, one, fleet size. There's an, uh, there's an interest in removing fleet size or finding another way to determine fleet size. Um, the other one was removal of the geofence. Uh, third, there were some questions around data. And the exciting part is that we're, we're now engaged in a real time back and forth around the data. Um, and finally, um, equity. And so equity continues to be a uh, one that people have questions about in terms of how do we actually implement an equity program that achieves um, equi equity um, goals. Um, and so we're here to answer any specific questions that you may have on the rules and guidelines. I think the other thing is I wanted to introduce Hunter Owens from ITA, who is their senior data scientist. And I think it also just shows our approach in terms of um, we know how to do transit and planning um, at LADOT, but I think um, it's important to um, bring in other techno technical skill sets to support um, the type of learning that the companies are already doing and the, and the tools that they're using to implement their, their business models. Thank you. Um, so thank you uh, for the testimony. Thanks to uh, everybody from the industry. Thanks to the, uh, the, the others who came expressing an opinion. Uh, this is uh, one of those issues uh, that, that government tends not to do well. Uh, because the technology moves a lot faster than us. Uh, we've uh, seen us uh, 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 way late to the game on short-term rentals, uh, on, um, uh, on, on ride shares, uh, and um, uh, we're eager to sort of get, even though this is already happening in Los Angeles, we're eager to, to get out as early as we can on this. So uh, it's important that uh, we're having this conversation. Having said that, it's a complex issue uh, because we've got both dockless bikes, we've got dockless scooters, we've got uh, different companies with different business models, um, most of whom prefer regulations that coincidentally coincide with their business models. Um, and um, uh, we have experience with these in, in different and discrete parts of the city. Um, uh, and we've seen how it's worked in some other parts of the world. And uh, in my district, uh, I don't have the dockless bikes. I've got the metro bikes. Uh, in my district for the past month and a half, um, uh, there have been uh, flocks of birds everywhere. And uh, I hear very strong reactions both ways. Uh, folks love them when they use them. Uh, and I hear a lot of folks who are concerned about clutter on the sidewalks or are afraid of uh, uh, pedestrians who are afraid of being run down. So a lot of different pieces here. Let me um, start, and I'll go, I'll go through a couple of them before I open it up. Uh, one of them is, is the data. Uh, I think uh, you guys have done a phenomenal job on thinking through the, the data issues, which I think is, is the biggest cornerstone piece of this, particularly from the government perspective. When we were dealing with short-term rentals, that was one of the biggest hurdles. I guess we're still dealing with it, but that was one of the, the, the biggest hurdles. And so uh, that is, is very, very important. And uh, I think you put a lot of energy into it, a lot of thought into it. Um, and it's, it's important not just for these dockless things, but also sort of transportation technology strategy more broadly. So uh, I want to commend you for that and uh, for the, also for the, the, the stated, and we'll hold you to it, continued commitment to keep talking to the industry about this. We need as much information as we can get because it will, will, will help us improve mobility for everybody, will help us manage our streets and, and our public spaces. Um, question on enforcement, uh, because, uh, you know, I did a, 
uh, an online survey for my constituents about uh, uh, dockless bikes and scooters. And uh, the those who were expressing concerns were expressing concerns about enforcement. Uh, not to, to single out the birds, but it's the one I got the most comments on, was it, folks are riding them on the sidewalk, and you're not allowed to have motorized stuff on the sidewalk. That We're not speaking to that specifically in the regulations because that's a state law regarding that, but um, what are what is the enforcement mechanism either for that, because we need to think about that as we do this, or for all the other elements of the other rules you've, you've proposed? So I would say there's, um, we're living in this world right now where we have uh, one foot in the old school and one foot in the new, right? And, and these regulations reflect that. Um, it is absolutely going to be important to have LAPD, both LAPD and the Bureau of Street Services engaged in this ongoing report back that we do on how this rollout occurs. LAPD is the department that's empowered to enforce sidewalk riding. Bureau of Street Services is the department that's empowered to enforce um, cluttering the sidewalk, blocking the sidewalk, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, that is the sort of um, old school, high, high touch way of doing enforcement. And that is absolutely going to have to be part of the rollout and, and part of our reporting back. And another reason why it's important to keep the fleet manageable at the beginning so that we can have help those departments understand what is going, and they can understand what is going to be required of them to enforce. And then they can, can figure out what does that mean from a staffing and budget perspective and make an informed request. Um, but the new school is really about getting um, ongoing real-time data about where these devices are, where they're being used, the state of good repair of the fleet, to Peter's point, um, the safety record of the fleet, and being able to get to a point where we can actually determine in real time that one of these companies is violating its trip cap or has has devices where they should not be and can impose a fine or can create a, a report on demand right away call them in hold them accountable and that's really the way that we're going to enforce I think it's a more elegant um, lower cost approach to enforcement in the future but we're not quite there yet right first we just need to see get our arms around what is this data even going to look like and what are the services we are going to need to build on top of it to do that kind of um, dynamic ongoing enforcement so uh, that's really the the thinking around enforcement and one of the reasons why we want to start getting things out there but do it in a manageable way so that we can come back with a with a better sort of sense of what we'll need well, that, that's an, an interesting point that, that speaks to your your recommended inventory caps it's uh, I mean our our aspirational desires for what we want to see in the city with the, the new dockless modes of transportation has to be tempered by our experience in uh, how well the city does enforcing things. Sometimes uh, our eyes are bigger than our stomach. Yeah, so that's, that's a good way of putting it. Right. Um, uh, okay. Um, well, and I would just, I'm so, I apologize for interrupting, but I would just add that if you're somebody whose interest it is to have a lot of these things all over the city available all the time, then it is in your interest that this rollout goes really well and that people feel really positively about this. And so doing it in a thoughtful, managed way is absolutely key to getting to the outcome that everybody wants. Um, okay. That brings me to uh, fleet size, which was uh, my, my next point. Uh, the, the numbers, explain to me how you came up with the numbers that you came up with. So first was looking at what other cities were doing. Um, and so I think, um, and on some of those numbers it ranged. So Seattle I think is now up to 10,000, um, a minimum of 10,000 10, vehicles total, yeah. or maximum what, in terms of total. Um, um, DC did a pilot, a year-long pilot that capped it at 400. Um, I think Palo Alto just released a pilot that capped it at 700. So we knew for LA we needed to be a little bit bigger um, and we needed to allow companies the ability to flex and to grow. What the first key piece is of, of just creating 
a relationship where we can just engage with the industry and understand their tech, they can understand our, our, our responsibilities. But we wanted to create a number that we felt was manageable um, from a staff perspective because with 10 companies potentially wanting to deploy, um, that's going to mean staff time sitting down and going and guiding them through the, um, the outreach process and working with them with the individual council offices. So there wasn't an exact science to it. I think we looked at um, what were some of the numbers that were currently out there um, in terms of the number of, of vehicles that some companies represent, but I think that allowed us to be manageable. Yeah, I'm not sure what I think about the, 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 the numbers or the cap. I, I, I personally, and we'll hear what the whole committee thinks, but I, I like the idea of a minimum number to make sure we've got, you know, legit players who can meet our standards, provide our data and stuff like that. Uh, I, I'm concerned about where a cap is, if there is one, uh, should there be one? If so, where is it? And should it be one that uh, you know, has a has a graduated status, depending on any any number of different factors? You know, I mean, we, we did hear good feedback from companies. They felt that if we put a cap on it, then that was the cap that every future growth was going to be based off. Like, we understand that. You know, um, the city of Palo Alto, they removed the cap um, and gave the authority to expand to the to their um, to their DOT general manager. Um, and so there are a couple of ways that to do it. I think the best way for us is through um, continuous feedback and coming back to um, working with the companies and then also coming back to not just this committee but to the Public Works Committee where they're going to, they also have an um, interest in terms of management of the public right of way and how BSS and sanitation um, engage in that. And so some of it is also going to be resource based. Oh, this has to go both through both committees? Yes, it's still oh. referred. Oh, okay. Well, we're not going to have this done until 2025. Um, uh, anytime you go to more than one committee, you're in trouble. Um, so, the, the cap touches on a couple different issues. It touches on geography and it touches on your, your circles of no doculus. And it also touches on, on, on the, the equity issue. Um, and I'm, I, I guess I need to tie all three of them together for the purpose of the, 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 the conversation. If you have these, what I think is extremely uh, uh, large buffer zones, uh, way too high. I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced we need the buffer zones yet. Um, so please address that. You obviously would need fewer bikes because you're taking away huge parts of the city and you're taking away parts of the city that are potentially most interested in having the technology. You would be taking away uh, a dockless in San Pedro, you would be taking away dockless in uh, downtown, you'd be taking away dockless uh, in Venice. So uh, that, that's a huge chunk of the market we're, we're taking away. Um, why are I, I know we're spending money and Metro is spending money on the, the the Metro bikes, but why are we so protective of that investment that we're not into competition at all? I think we wanted to start out just giving you a very consistent recommendation, and we wanted to make sure that you know we were being thoughtful about the partnership we have with Metro. Now, having said that, we've heard very clearly from um, uh, uh, Council District 15. Um, and also, uh, you know, different opinions in your office as well about the fact that, look, these are already operating conditions that are occurring in those neighborhoods. And so maybe it makes sense not to have geofence in those locations. And that's, we're, we're very open to that. In downtown, uh, we could certainly shrink the geofence. I would uh, say that we've, we've spoken to um, Council Office 14 as well. Um, they're flexible and interested in uh, potentially shrinking that geofence, but um, have an interest in um, potentially keeping it in place at least initially for the first three months or six months of the program um, to sort of see how it operates in other parts of the city and make sure that we get the public realm and public right-of-way management piece really 
nailed before we invite uh, those things into downtown. Downtown sidewalks are the, some of the, the busiest sidewalks in the city, um, some of the most crowded sidewalks in the city, most complex environment to manage all of these different things. Um, it's also, as I mentioned before, it's also an important incentive. We know that all of these companies want to be in downtown um, and we'd like to open it up. We don't, and we don't imagine that that geofence will be in place forever and ever, amen. Um, but that it is a valuable sort of uh, um, initial way to figure out how to manage the public right-of-way in other parts of the city before we bring them into downtown. I would also just say on the cap, um, you know, Bird currently has about 2,300 uh, vehicles out over on the west side in Santa Monica. So 2,500 is about the size of, you know, a neighborhood. So it gives us a sort of a... Uh, a way to begin that allows us to begin in sort of a managed way. And, it, and as a reminder, they can have up to 5,000 um, if they want to go into other parts of the city that we've, that we've sort of identified. Yeah. Um, one of my concerns with the cap, uh, well, I'm, I'm concerned with, and I'm torn on this, and I'm going to recommend we continue this a couple more weeks to, to think more about it and get more feedback. This report's only been online for two days. I'm just starting to get feedback from people with, with interest in it. Um, you know, haven't heard from any of the NCs or anything like that, and I think we owe the public a little more feedback, giving them the opportunity for more feedback. Is uh, And I'm still thinking through a lot of this, even as you're talking. Some of it is convincing me and some of it uh, not so much. I, I'm, I'm concerned about the approach of having maybe a different standard for downtown. Because if we do that, then we are going to start piecemealing this in this committee, in the next committee, at full council, and it's going to be this, this crazy patchwork quilt of different regulations, which are the opposite of your red light analogy, uh, just internally to Los Angeles. And I, I think I also don't want this committee to have to become the uh, the, the dockless committee and have to be revisiting this every 60 days. You know, I, I want something that we can try out for, you know, a year and, and, and see how it works. But you, you make a valid point about once they're here, they're, they're here. Um, but the, the, the point of the, the, the other reason I asked about the, the, the cap is uh, I'm concerned about the, the, the equity issue. Uh, and the the distribution um, if if they have a cap left to their own devices with just a cap, the bikes are going to be in my district they 'll probably be in in c d fifteen they 'll be in in in, in paul 's district um, and that 's where they 're going to use their their cap they 're not going to put them in other parts of the city um, so uh, is there a way to use a cap and exemptions to encourage them in other parts of the city, either through the cap or through a different fee structure in other parts of the city? Yeah, so um, we, we definitely, having been at this committee on other new mobility options, we've definitely heard loud and clear how do we start incentivizing um, deployment of these services in other communities, particularly that, um, you know, may be disadvantaged. And so um, one of the tools we looked at, we looked to, that was the tool that was used for um, the EV car sharing program was using the Cal Enviro screen 3.0. And so that is an index that's established by the state um, that takes into account socioeconomic um, status and then also um, exposure to environmental impacts. And so um, whether or not that's the, the only tool to use, I think it could, is debatable, but we looked at something that we've used before. And so um, this additional 2,500 um, that would increase the total fleet size to 5,000 is specifically for communities that are in disadvantaged communities, um, the top 75th percentile. Now we can go more nuanced to that to start digging even to the, to the highest level, levels of disadvantaged communities census tracts. But when you look at that map, that specifically carves out totally the west side. Um, it carves out into what you see is like central Los Angeles, south Los Angeles, so, south Los Angeles, the northeast San Fernando Valley. And so those are areas that um, we think is a tool to incentivize because, again, as Salida mentioned earlier, um, penalizing and removing 
permits, like that's not the way to go. We don't want to kick people out unless they're like they're gross operators and negligent. So I think that was one of the strategies that we proposed. We're open to considering other ones. Um, I think in terms of the pricing, um, the only thing, we only heard from one company out of all that we talked about that we're sensitive to the pricing. Um, two last questions that I think are quick. I'm just not clear on the rationale behind something. Uh, there's your, your recommended e-bike requirement. Uh, I'm all in favor of requiring electric buses. I'm all in favor of requiring electric automobiles because it's better environmentally than the non-electric version. Uh, that makes sense to me. Why for uh, something that is the, the ultimate sustainable mode of transportation, uh, 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 self-powered, uh, bicycle or a scooter, are we incentivizing electric bikes or electric scooters given that that's actually worse for the environment? So for us, it's not so much of an environmental play. It's about making sure that the widest number of Angelinos possible can use these bikes. So there's great research, actually there's research that came out just this week, that e-bikes in particular increase both the demographics of people who are biking, both across gender and age. So older adults, women, people who might not necessarily be in the best shape but who are using bikes as a way to get in shape, that e-bikes um, are sort of appealing and actually better used by a broader spectrum of folks. Right now what we see in the city of LA is very similar to most other cities, that about three quarters of the people on bikes are fit white males. So in order to make sure that we get the broader sort of mix of folks out on bikes, we wanted to have a fleet that would appeal to the broadest number of, of Angelinos possible. So it's not really about an environmental play. It's about making sure that if you're a little intimidated, you don't know if you can get your bike up that hill, but you really want to try it, that there is a bike in this fleet that's attractive to you that you might want to use. I gotta say, that may be the best retort to a point I've made ever. Um, uh, uh, that was... <laughs> <laughs> that was well done. I, I humbly accept that, council member, <laughs> and recognize that I've peaked and will stop speaking yeah. for the rest of the meeting. Uh, yeah, I didn't expect that either. That's rather compelling. It, yeah. Um, uh, one last question on the, the locking mechanism. Uh, uh, you know, the companies that, that lock are fine with it, and the companies that don't aren't, uh, unsurprising. But... Um, I want to know what the rationale is for that, because here, here's my concern with it, is, uh, and I think Mehmet mentioned this in his letter, if someone locks it to someplace it shouldn't be, then it's impossible to move it. And I have a, a, a good friend of mine, a constituent, uh, who is, is, is pro all forms of mobility, uh, and she says one of her new daily tasks is while she walks to the store is she moves uh, a, 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 a bird scooters that are blocking the sidewalk out of the way. If folks are locking them in, in, in the wrong place, then she can't help her dad, who's walking with her, pass through the narrow area. Sure. So as we surveyed other cities, I think this was the one issue and the, the big question of debate. Um, because they, are, they still are struggling with how to manage that public right-of-way issue. I think the challenge with some of, um, to those systems that don't have a secondary device is that once the trip is ended on the app, anyone can pick up that bike and no one's accountable. So I can be totally in compliance, leave the scooter or the bike perfectly parked, someone else can come in and do anything that they want with that vehicle, and so who's accountable? So. Um, and this, so the secondary lock two device was, as Salita kind of, you know, explained the old school versus the new school. I think it is already becoming old school, um, but it allows us to have the certainty of that someone who ended the ride locked the the vehicle to something, and then there is the ability to hold whoever did that accountable. Um, I think that it's not perfect. We've ha again, we had some great feedback from the industry in terms of. Um, you know, is bicycle parking infrastructure prop, you know, adequately distributed throughout the city? Is that another potential equity question? Um, I think also it's why we wrote this, the sentence right after that, um, that requirement that said LADOT reserves the right 
to waive this. And I think that is kind of the transition period to like the new school. So if we're getting the data the way we need to be getting the data, um, we can create algorithms that are are notifying us that these they're out of parking compliance and the parking out of compliance is happening 10% of the time or 15% of the time and we can send a note to the company saying, hey, what's going on? So it, it's that it's that straddling, um, but you know, it's 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 open to a policy recommendation as well. You know, in terms of how we do that, and it sounds if we're going to have continued dis debate over this, I think this is going to be one of those items that um, that rise up because it, in some instances, it sets some companies at a at a competitive advantage right off the bat, and so. That's why the other thing in terms of evening the playing field as much as possible, um, starting with the fleet size that rewards good behavior and, and good companies, that's part of the rationale on the cap size too because there are some of these things that we're still going to need um, to evaluate and, and, and report back on. I'll point out something wonky about the sidewalk, which is that if you have a secondary lock and you have to lock your device to a thing, the things that you can lock your device to on our sidewalks in LA are usually out of the pedestrian path of travel. So that's part of the rationale for the secondary lock and the way the secondary lock has been compelling in other cities is that if you're going to lock it to something, it's going to be a meter, or it's going to be a bike rack, or it's going to be a street tree, or it's going to be who knows what, but that's not going to be right in the middle of somebody's path of travel on the sidewalk. So it's a, a way of sort of nudging all of those things into the furniture zone. But as Marcel pointed out, um, you know, it's, a, it's a, a policy option open for debate and consideration. Yeah, I know... Just not as good as your last one, by the way. Um, I know. I told you I peaked, and then I just kept it, talking. It, I know. You know, when I, when I use my bike, it, it's in many places, it's hard to find a place to lock it. And, yep. you know, there are times when, you know, either I or someone else has, you know, locked it to someone's fence or something like that, and I'm just concerned about that. Mr. Kretz? I'm dying to see where you come down on this. Um, well, actually, you might be surprised <laughs> I, I'm open to these new innovative programs, and I'm... <laughs> you sound smart. I... Shocked! <laughs> I... Dad, no, 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 get them on a scooter now. <laughs> I, I, haven't, later. I haven't tried a bird scooter. If I fell off, I might have a different opinion. But I think first, last mile options are critical, and this provides uh, some of those. Um, I am concerned about the geofence concept and I think for us it, it almost eliminates our ability to do a lot of that first last mile stuff that we should be doing um, unless we're legally required to kowtow to Metro frankly we're weakening our ability to do it in favor of theirs and I would want to eliminate this so we can actually from a policy perspective, have this operate in the way that we want it to. So I, I it's truly a disruptive technology. If you've got me and Mr. Koretz agreeing on transportation, <laughs> yeah, uh, that could be true. <laughs> could disrupt the committee. I don't know. Um, but I don't know. Is there any advantage to us deferring to Metro in in doing this? It's entirely a policy consideration, council member, that is, that's, that's really up to you all. So if you wanted to lift all the geofences citywide, that's, that's up to you. There's no requirement um, on Metro's behalf that we do that. Well, I certainly would be uh, in favor of that from the get-go. Um, also, I have questions about, about costs. $50 a bike seems high. How did we get to that number? Um, what do other jurisdictions charge, and how does that translate to the average rider and what they pay per trip? And are our rates high enough that they'll discourage folks in low-income neighborhoods, which I assume with the equity goal, we want this to, to work in for, for those neighborhoods as well? Um, so the, the fee is, so let me first say that the, reiterate that the only feedback that we got from the, from the industry about it, we only heard from one company that had an issue with the fees. Um, I think we also wanted, because we don't know what the the, um, the true impact is going to be until we get into the pilot, we wanted to create something and price something that allowed, that we didn't feel like we were going to be under-resourced to manage the program. Um, 
that's the other key. And then we also looked at what some other cities were charging to um, the per bike fee. And I think we are um, on par with Chicago, but we are definitely among the highest. And again, that, that tends to be because we are also a large city. And so if these companies are going to expand and we're going to need to um, put together infrastructure to support uh, proper expansion, we wanted to make sure that we weren't being shy about collecting fees. And also, since uh, I've probably shocked Mr. Bonin already, maybe I'll shock him again and say, uh, I think we could help fund our stuff by putting advertising on the bicycles and docking stations. You want dockless billboards? Uh, <laughs> Uh, little ones, perhaps. Uh, uh, digital ones? You want digital ones? Well, I don't know about digital. That might be going a little too far. But, uh, but I think some advertising on the bikes and the stations might be able to offset some of our, our expenses and make them more the sustainable. Over. So uh, <laughs> not that I've been a big one for uh, outdoor advertising, but uh, in, this, in this case, I think it might be worth looking at. Um, also, in terms of blocking the sidewalks, I don't know if, if uh, although we've said it, the companies are not that responsive to, to cost in that way, but I would think we could combine a fine for blocking the sidewalks with uh, a fine in terms of number of vehicles that the companies are allowed and have those be subtracted when we start to run into serious problems with blocking. And I think they should also be able to pass on the, any fines for blocking to their customers. So if a customer, they should have to notify them very clearly when they, when they take a bike um, that if they leave it blocking uh, the sidewalk that they will have to pay a fine. And then they should just do that. Um, and I would hope a combination of, of fines to consumers and the company actually losing some of their ability to, to uh, provide vehicles um, together might be able to eliminate most of that sidewalk blockage. Because that's actually my biggest concern about, about the program. And that's all I've got. I'm still stuck on the dockless billboards. <laughs> uh, Ms. Martinez? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I don't have any dockless bicycles or scooters or any of that fancy stuff you guys got in your <laughs> districts. Um, we're just simply trying to cross the street without getting killed, just to put it all in perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but my question to you is, um, can multiple operators apply for a permit in the same area, or is there fir first come, first serve? How would that work? Uh, we, we're allowing for all of them to come into the okay. same area. So will you, have, um, will you cap the number of operators that come into an area? Or it's just come one, wasn't come on. That, I don't think that that's we're we're just saying we're saying anybody who wants to can come and apply, mm -hmm. and they can have up to you know twenty five hundred initially, and another twenty five hundred in these areas that we've articulated. But you can have unlimited number of operators. Unlimited number of operators. So we talked to eight. Is that right? Eight. So that's imagine every single one of them went all the way up to the cap we provided. That's forty thousand devices on the streets of Los Angeles that we're saying are, are allowed anywhere they want to go. I mean, the other cap is really about, not anywhere, but uh, because of the Cal Enviro screen piece. Right. Okay. But 40,000 devices. Um, and so under the, the, under the parking section C, it states that the operators um, shall remove the scooters from the public right-of-way on a daily basis. Does that also apply to bicycles obstructing the um, public right-of-way, or how would that, what is the difference? Or is that limited based on um, compl a complaint process? How would that work? Because there's a distinction between how you, what you're enforcing the scooters to do versus the vice bicycle operators when it comes to removing them off the public right of way, the sidewalks. Right. I'm looking for it specifically, but... So I found it under parking section C. Right, so that is the recommendation um, and consistent with um, at least one of the company's existing practices to remove the e-scooters um, that's what Bird does, right? nightly. Right, and so that was feedback that we took um, when we were developing the right-of-way uh, or the, this parking section. I believe um, we also have a section in here that requires um, upon, 
a call for the company is that they remove the bikes within a certain give amount of time, and then there there's uh, Monday through Friday um, from like nine to six, I think within two hours, and then on the weekend I think it's maybe up within 24 hours, and so I can confirm that. But. Okay. Yeah, because I did I did thought that was um, an interesting distinction, but I like the fact that the scooters. Uh, on a daily basis, uh, go around the neighborhoods, make sure that their scooters are off the public right away. I think UCLA, Mr. Corretz, if I'm not mistaken, that's what they do in that area, with the west yeah, area? Yeah, I think they do with, where they have and, well, much more density of right. usage. And then also for the e-scooters, e-scooters have op operating hours because they need to be charged daily. And so they're taking off for, for maintenance and for charging okay. before they come back I'm on. I was going to say that. Anyway, but, um, and, you know, I like the idea of actually having 24-hour availability of systems because there may be this may be a resiliency gap, right? If we don't have Dash or Metro operating at 3 a.m., someone needs to jump on one of these to get somewhere. I, I mean, I think that's a great. That's we want to encourage that, and so I think it's just about ma making sure that the companies are um, adhering to standards to to respond to concerns about blocking the right of way. Uh, and the last. Um, thing I want to raise, and I think Mr. Englander raised it through his office earlier in public comment, is what role would the council office play in this entire process? I, for one, I know that this is not in my district, but if it were to come to my district, I would like to have uh, a say or be involved in terms of where these stations are being um, suggested. So I think we need to explore that a little bit more, what that process looks like. I'm not sure if it's the uh, acknowledgement letter that was previously mentioned, but I, I, would, I for me, would like to know. Um, where this makes sense and would like to be involved in that process. Okay. That's all I have. Mr. Kretz. And uh, I agree with uh, Ms. Martinez and uh, would be a second voice for, for some sort of process that did that. Sure. Um, only other question I have is, is there any way to provide more equity rather than having the companies sort of go where the money is and we know that's where we are. I have a suggested recommendation on that, actually. But uh, I was thinking if there, I don't know if there's a way to change the pricing in lower income neighborhoods to incentivize it. Um, yep. But I, I'm happy to hear what you have to suggest, but that concept, I think, should be looked at. Well, so we, we do have um, certain things around equity. And again, this continues to evolve. But um, where we're going to require like an equ that they submit an equity plan we have a requirement for a low-income fare structure as well for the companies. Um, but I think a lot of this is going to be really foundational because this just might be a, what, we, what our best thinking is, but I think it's really understanding and working with the companies to make sure that we hit those targets. And I'm going to let Hunter talk a little bit about how we plan to do that. Yeah, to reiterate, uh, Hunter Owens Information Technology Agency, one of the crucial things in driving an equitable system is having actionable information, um, and that's why beginning a standardized data collection process remains so key. Um, we might not get perfect equity in the first three months, but understanding where the costing information is coming from, which, who is using what types of devices, we can then use that to help push these regulations, and again, through the check back process, uh, in a way that drives increased equity in a way that we know works, rather than just throwing darts at a wall. OK. Uh, so um, question, why different response times on the weekends for removing? I think that was just based off some, uh, some conversations with the industry, some initial rounds of conversations um, that we had in December, and then also mirroring some of the conversations that we've had with other cities. So but, in, a, in a lot of parts of this, I think we should be uh, listening very closely to uh, the industry's thoughts on how we do different pieces of it. Uh, on this piece, though, uh, this is an enforcement piece. Uh, and this is responding to uh, a, a, a senior who can't use the sidewalk on their block, I don't think there should be a different standard on the weekends. Uh, I don't think, the, with all due respect, the industry's concerns about that should be different. Um, a, a, a blockage of, a, of the public right-of-way is a blockage of the public right-of-way, and I think the, the, the standard should be pretty universal. Um, so generally, um, what, I, what I'm going to recommend, um, we'll see how this goes, is uh, that um, we continue this until uh, the second meeting in June, um, that uh, DOT come back with a 
uh, a recommendation, uh, or yeah, a recommendation from the uh, uh, the brief and fleeting Bon and Caret's Transportation Alliance <laughs> um, uh, to uh, get rid of the geofences. Um, uh, I would also ask that, uh, given that the geofences get removed under this, I'd like DOT to come back with a different recommendation on the the caps because that changes the dynamic I think um, and if you want to come back with a couple different options for us as we often have the city attorney do uh, for ordinances that's that's fine if you want to give us a couple different uh, uh, ways of, of looking at, at doing caps given that the geofences are out um, uh, I would also ask that um, uh, you remove the lock piece I, I'm okay with us requiring it later, but I think that, that should be driven by the data because I'm, I'm just afraid of the impacts right now of things getting locked up uh, and not being able to be moved. Um, my, my big concern with all of this is the public right-of-way being blocked, and I'm just afraid of stuff blocking the public right-of-way. Uh, and if the, the, the data is showing we're having a problem that the locking would address, then I think the locking would make sense. Um, the other is I want to address the... the the, the, the equity piece, and it's sort of along the lines that uh, Mr. Koretz was uh, saying, um, is could we, I'd like to at least see what it would look like, could we see a system where the, uh, the, the, the cost per device is more expensive in my district uh, and is less expensive or free in Ms. Martinez's district. So that areas that are, are, that are suffering from a lack of equity, they're, they're incentivized through financial structure. Understand? Yes, we understand. We'll come back with a recommendation. Okay. All right. Um, and then um, uh, I forgot to mention, but love the requirements for access without smartphones or credit cards. I think that's, that's very important and helps with the, uh, the, the equity piece. Um, and um, I do think we should keep the, the 500 device minimum, as I said earlier. Uh, I think that's important. And um, I, I just want to come up with a, a mechanism for us to be able to evaluate the enforcement, you know, whether it's some reporting mechanism from DOT, BOSS, uh, BSS, LAPD, not that sort of built into the requirements, but a recommendation on what that process should look like, because I think that's going to need some ongoing dialogue between those agencies, uh, and happy to help in whatever it takes to convene that. Um, anything else? That, that makes sense? Does the council have mm -hmm. What I mentioned? We've got the yeah. sure. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, OK. OK. Um, thank you very much. All right, that brings us to item number two. Which is funding for the 6th Street uh, Arts District Station EIR. Two, two items, two special meeting. Yeah. Uh, is Mr. Hayward still here? Anybody here from CD14? Okay. Uh, uh, the, um, we, we need to make a technical amendment to this. Uh, so uh, the CAO has uh, a proposed amendment providing technical uh, changes. Uh, do we need to read that into the record or anything? Or do we yeah. have a copy provided? Do you have a copy? All right, we can give it to the clerk in writing. Uh, so without objection, that item uh, is approved as amended. He needs a Is there a speaker card? I'm sorry, there, there's some speaker cards on this item. My apologies. Um, uh, Gerard Wright, Hillary Norton, uh, Joanne Danganen, and Hillary Norton again. You only get to talk once. <laughs> okay. We're, we're, we were poised to move this forward if that impacts the length of your testimony. Right. As, as Richard 
El Tor used to say, when you have the votes, don't educate. We're just here to thank <laughs> you. And uh, because really we appreciate the, uh, the, the work of Councilmember Weezar. And I wanted to say that I'm here on behalf of FAST and the LA Chamber who couldn't be here but has been a strong advocate for this. And uh, also La Raba, HCNC. And um, I'm also speaking as the chair of the BizFed board. This is an opportunity, this motion today, is an opportunity to focus away from single occupant vehicles and toward increased transit, microtransit, cycling, and walking on existing metro tracks. We want to thank you for helping to grow the Arts District and all of DTLA more inclusively with this motion. And we ask for your support. Thank you. All right. Gerard Wright, Policy Manager for LA County Business Federation, Grassroots Alliance, uh, over 170 business organizations, employing 3.5 million people in Los Angeles County. And this wonderful woman is uh, the board chair for 2018, and we're proud to have her as a board chair leading in a, in a direct way. This is something we've been pushing uh, as for BizFed members for the past three years before Measure M came along. And so this is a great moment in time in the benchmark of this particular station and the greater parts of Los Angeles County is an opportunity that can be met with this study that can be made for further enhancement. But for right now, as uh, indicated, we have the votes, so to speak, and <laughs> let's not muddy the waters. Let's keep <laughs> moving forward. Thank you, uh, City Council, for the efforts on the funding and to see a, a good study around this important station. Thank you so very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Hi again, joined again with CCA. Um, we support the efforts to connect the, the city to all neighborhoods of downtown, including the Arts District, which continues to see incredible investment. Uh, we fully support a 6th Street Arts District station, that, uh, as it is an essential connection to a neighborhood that sees more and more foot traffic each day, but deeply lacks ample transit options. Environmental clearance and pre-design of the station are a great start, so thank you for um, hopefully your support. I'd like to also mention, since Mr. Bonin, you are a member of the Metro Board of Directors, that we are working with a number of downtown stakeholders to explore the possibility of an east-west connection related to but separate from the West Santa Ana branch. We think the 6th Street Arts District Station would be a great terminus for that. Uh, we have sent a letter uh, to Metro about this request, and we'll be at the board meeting tomorrow to discuss in detail. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so that item is approved. Mr. Chairman. Allow the clerk to read the amendment into... What's that? Allow the clerk to read the, the amendment into the... The amendment is to clerk. authorize the CAO to make any necessary technical changes to this action. Okay. Uh, without objection, that's the recommendation of the committee. And uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Very good.